All right, we are in the book of Jude. If you got a Bible, we're going to turn to the book of Jude. But the book of Jude is one chapter. It's a very short book in the Bible. It's 25 verses, and it is packed with power. Jude comes right before the book of Revelation. Jude was a a half-brother to Jesus. He was a full brother to James. And we forget that Jesus had brothers, that Mary and Joseph had other children besides Jesus. Jesus obviously was divine conception. His actual father was God. Joseph was a stepfather. But Jesus had half-brothers. James and Jude were some of his brothers. And Jude was this man who decided to follow Jesus after Jesus had risen from the grave and ascended into heaven. And Jude devoted his life as a missionary, a martyr to Lebanon, Beirut, and gave his life to share the good news and to share the gospel with people around him. And during his time, there was all kinds of heresy. There was all kinds of things that were sneaking and creeping into the church that were pulling people away from the truth of what Jesus proclaimed. And so he begins this message calling these people out. He was like, listen, if you want to call yourself a Christian, you need to live like a Christian. You need to pursue the heart and the the message of Christ, not just look for the benefits and the blessings from God. Like we're not in this just to see what we can get from the hand of God. We want to know the heart of God. We want to follow after Jesus. Is there any real Christians in the house today that want to know the heart of God? You want to follow Jesus. You're not just in this for the benefits, right? And, and that's what Jude preaches about. He's, that's what he's talking about. So last week we talked about contending for the faith. That word contend, he says in Jude verse three, he says, contend for the faith. I feel the urge to tell you to defend the faith. What does that mean? It means to fight for the faith. This faith is something we've got to fight for. And he, he uses a term called apologetics, which basically means to, to be able to defend what we believe, like a lawyer would defend in a case. Uh, 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 someone that he's defending, that in the same way we have a calling as Christians to defend this faith, to defend our theology, that in our lifetime there will be people who want to come into the church and twist the gospel to create a Christianity that feels convenient, comfortable, easy, right? They want to lower the standard. They want to create something that's unbiblical. And we have a calling to defend the faith. And today I want to talk to you about the danger of deception. Because Jude is about to warn us that deception is rampant, that people are being deceived left and right. The, the, the word deception, it just means to trick somebody, to lie to somebody, to, to convince somebody of something that's not true. This happened to me, I was on a mission trip several years ago as a kid, and I went with my mom and dad to Israel. And we were on a bus and we were driving, doing a Holy Land tour. And there were people from our church who came, and then there were some people from other churches who came. And me and my brother, we were sitting in the back of the bus and my parents are in the front and we were kind of getting bored. And this guy comes back there. He was like a young adult. And he was like, hey, you guys want to play some games? We were like, yes, we wanted to. We, we, we were bored. We were like, we want to play games. Yes. And he's like, I got a great game for you. He pulls out a deck of cards. Now, we had not really played a lot of cards growing up. I don't know why. It was just not a huge deal in our house. And so we were excited. We we're like, teach us these card games. And he's like, I got a game you guys are going to love. And we were like, yes, you know, we were eight, nine years old. We were so excited. We were like, teach us the game. And he goes, it's called 52 card pickup. <laughs> we had no clue. We were like, yes, this sounds amazing. Now, let me just pause for a second. If we believe everything, we will fall for anything. If we believe everything we hear in church, we can fall for anything. One of the ways that the devil deceives Christians is that he gets us in this gullible state where anything and everything is just accepted and believed. If somebody's smiling, they must be telling me the truth, right? And in this case, this man was on the bus. He was a really good magician. He was a good trickster. He was really good at convincing us this was gonna be the greatest game of our life. So we're sitting in the back of the bus and he goes, y'all wanna play this game, 52 card pickup? We were like, yes, let's do it. He goes, you gotta promise me that you're gonna play the game. We were like, yes, we promise you. Pinky promise, you know, and he takes the deck of cards. And I still remember this was so mean because we were so excited. We had big smiles on our face. Just these two little kids just waiting for this game. Takes the deck of cards. He throws it in our face. The cards fall all over the ground. And he says, pick them up. And I was like, well, when does the game start? He says, this is the game. 52 card pickup. 
pick up every card. And he walks away and I was like, this is the meanest man I've ever met in my life. He tricked me. He manipulated me, right? Deceived us. This is how the devil works though. He deceives us. He tricks us. And Jude warns, he says in verse four, he says, I say these things because there are ungodly people who have wormed their way into your churches to play 52 card pickup. No, he says, they've wormed your way into their church, in your churches, and they want to trick you to believe that the grace of God is a license to live immoral. To, to convince you that the grace of God is a permission slip to live however you want to live because it's covered by the blood. We can do what we want to do, however we want to do it, whatever we want to do it. And he says, they have twisted the gospel. And their condemnation, the, 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 like this declaration, this prophetic word was recorded long ago, for they have denied our master and Lord Jesus Christ. This is the half-brother of Jesus, and he's calling Jesus his master, his Lord. Talk about reverence. Talk about honor. He could have said, my brother Jesus. He said, my master, my savior, my Lord. Why? Because Jude honored God. We're living in a culture where people have stopped honoring God stopped honoring God's word, stopped honoring God's authority, stopped honoring the authority of the scripture, the inspired, infallible word of God. This is a Bible-believing church, by the way. If you don't like the Bible, you may not like victory, but we're gonna preach the word of God. As for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. We're not gonna take our cues from American culture. We're not gonna take our cues from the White House. We're not gonna take our cues on what the Supreme Court votes is okay and acceptable in our time. We're gonna find out who we are in Christ through the word of God. We're gonna follow this moral compass this is the way, the truth, and the life. And I, listen, people might say the Bible's old fashioned. It's old school. We need to leave it behind. We need to redefine our theology. No, 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 no. This thing has outlasted princes and rulers and presidents. And this thing has outlasted every trendy idea and every creative philosophy, like any idea you've heard out there, this, this stands true. Thousands of years later, this still stands true. The story of God, the principles of God, the power of God, the words of Jesus Christ, the red letters, this is what we need. The world is trying to redefine our sexuality, our gender. We, we wanna call our pronouns. You call me this, you can call me them, they, that. Listen, you are a child of God. He doesn't make accidents. You are, a, you are created by God for a purpose because you have a purpose. But the world will tell you, no, you should define yourself. You should do what, listen, God doesn't know what he's talking about. You should be your own God. And it's chaos and it's confusion. And it's taking generations away from the truth of God's word. Jude warns, he says, there's, there's a coming day of judgment. Verse five, he says, you know this, but I wanna remind you. I wanna remind you that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, pulled them out of darkness, but later destroyed those who did not remain faithful. In other words, God is a merciful God, but he's also a just God. And his love is inseparable. He will always love us, but the love of God is a separate category from the consequences of our sin. And people wanna have no consequences. I just wanna do what I wanna do, no consequences, because the love of God, the love of God will always be there, but the consequences of our sin are real. He says, I wanna remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority. Hold on, wait a minute. We need to recognize angels had free will. How do you think Lucifer, who was created by God as an angel to be a worship leader in heaven, chose to exalt himself above God, was cast like lightning, Ezekiel said. I saw you falling from heaven like lightning. Took a third of the angels with him. Angels had the option to obey God or follow their own desires. During the time of Noah, right before the flood came, there were angels who actually slept with women on earth and rejected the authority of God, rejected the lordship of God. Is it okay that we go deep this Sunday of spring break? You're like, Paul, it's March Madness. Can we chill for a second? No, we're going, we don't have time to chill. Yes, Jesus is coming back. Every Sunday matters. Every time we get in the word of God matters. It is life or death. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but somebody needs the truth this morning. And don't mistake truth as hate. Truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. 
people who have been fed all kinds of candy cake Christianity that's like untruthful, they, 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 as soon as they hear this, they're like, this is offensive, this is politically incorrect. The Bible is politically incorrect. The, the cross is offensive. The Bible was not written to be politically correct. The Bible was not written to make us all feel happy and, and easygoing and comfortable and convenient. The Bible was meant to call us out of darkness into light, out of the demonic strongholds that the enemy wants to keep us in and sin and addiction and all these things that are holding us back into the purpose and the plans of God. God doesn't want to rob you of joy and happiness and laughter. He wants to give you real joy. He wants to, like, all these other things that our flesh craves, it's temporary happiness, it's temporary laughter. But real life, real joy is found in following Jesus. So Jude says, I wanna remind you, listen, angels, angels left their position of authority. They forsook what God, even angels can be deceived. If you don't think you can be deceived, you're already deceived. You go, I've graduated deception. I've, I've learned all there is to know about Christianity. I've read my Bible. There's nothing new you could teach me. You're too young to teach me. It's not about me. It's about the spirit of the word of God. Whoever's preaching this, I need to be open because the second I close my ears and think I'm above being deceived, I'm already deceived. He says angels were even deceived. Stay on that verse six just for a second. Stay on that verse six. He says God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. There will be a great day of judgment for the ungodly and the godly. For those who are godly, that means people who have chosen to give our lives to Jesus. We have confessed him as Lord and Savior. We have put our faith in the grace of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. I'm not saved because I'm a good person. I'm not saved because I went to church. I'm saved because I called on the name of the Lord. And there's a day of judgment for those who called on the name of the Lord. And that judgment is gonna be full of mercy. I'm so thankful that I've put my faith in Jesus Christ, but for those who've rejected the Lordship of God, for those who've said, there is no God, I don't believe in him, I will not follow him, the day of judgment for them is gonna be much different. There's judgment for both the righteous and those who are ungodly, those who've rejected God as Lord. The judgment for those who are calling on Jesus, that's you and me, there's gonna be a lot of mercy and a lot of grace, and I'm so thankful that we get to stand in that place But for those who say there is no God, for those who say I'm gonna do what I wanna do, I define what I want. Jude says there's a judgment coming. Verse seven, he says, don't forget about Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality. Sodom and Gomorrah was one of the most beautiful places in Israel, it was lush green grass, beautiful garden, flowers, trees, everything was beautiful. But Jude says their internal fire that they couldn't put out, their fire of lust, their fire of fleshly cravings eventually burned them up. They were burned by their own internal fire that they couldn't control. And they were destroyed. It was self-destruction. God's judgment is coming. He says, in the same way, these people who claim authority in verse eight, these people who claim authority from their dreams, hold on. In other words, Jude says there's people who have come into the church and they say, I've got this dream about God. I got this vision. I got this idea. The second we hear that, we should go, does this line up with the word of God? The second you hear someone teaching, including me, we should ask ourselves, does this line up with the word of God? Including Ty Barker, including Sharon Darty, including Billy Joe, including Oral Roberts. We should ask ourselves, no man is above the word of God. Just because they got clever ideas, just because they sound so charismatic and so, like, it's just, it's it's exciting. I remember as a pastor's kid watching my dad on the front row when guest preachers would come in, and sometimes a guest preacher would say something, and I wanted to know what his reaction was. You could see it on his face. He was just like, "Mm mm-mm. And sometimes I was wondering if he was going to get up on stage and literally correct the guest speaker. And later on that night, I would ask him at the house, Dad, what'd you think about such and such and and what they said? And he would say, that's not what we believe. And I would say, are you gonna talk about it? He said, yeah, I was praying whether I should say it tonight in church or if I'll say it next Sunday. He said, I'm gonna say it next Sunday. (laughs) And he would correct it. And he would speak about what is the word of God for us? Because people will take this and they will use it as a license to say whatever they wanna say. And this is why we gotta be very, we gotta be filled with the honor for God, the honor for God's word. He says there's people who claim authority from their dreams, but they live immoral lives. They defy authority, they scoff at supernatural beings. 
They make fun of God. They make fun of the Holy Spirit. They make fun of the angels, the demons. They make fun of anything that has to do with scripture. This has been around for thousands of years, but it's increased in America. Just total mockery on on the news, on comedy shows, just making fun of Christians, making fun of God, making fun of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Be careful that you don't engage in that way. Jude says, watch yourself. These people, they're deceiving. They'll pull you into it. He says, even Michael in verse 9, one of the mightiest angels in heaven, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy. Even Michael honored Lucifer as another angel. But he, in that honor, he used the word of God. He says, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. In other words, I'm not going to try to do this in my own authority. I'm going to do this under the authority of God. In verse 10, he says, these people scoff at things they don't understand. In other words, they, get, they just laugh at stuff they don't understand. Speaking in tongues, they'll make fun of it, right? Prophecy, any gifts of the Holy Spirit, healing, laying on of hands, anything that just does not make sense to them logically, they scoff at it. He says, like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them. They would rather follow their instinctual fleshly desires than put their faith in the God who created them. And so they follow whatever their flesh wants. And this is Jude, he's, he's talking to us. You know, I was thinking about this term red flags because what Jude is giving here is red flags in the church. He's saying, be careful when you start to see this spirit creep in your own life or the people around you. What is a red flag? It's a warning sign. It's a signal of danger. It's a heads up of potential disaster. If a red flag is on a beach, it means you better not get into the ocean unless you are a professional swimmer. I made the mistake of one time swimming when there was red flags on the beach and my wife said, don't get in there. And I said, don't worry, I'm a professional swimmer. If it's a double red flag, policemen will find you. They will give you a ticket for getting in the water. But one red flag, you can get in if you're a professional swimmer, but they highly encourage you not to because there's rip tides, there's currents beneath the water you can't see. And I got into the Pacific Ocean, this was years ago, and when I got in, I got pulled out to sea. And the waves started crashing on me. And as I was swimming back to shore, about a 10 to 12 foot wave came on, on top of me in the Pacific Ocean, smashed me. I had a concussion. I lost my hearing for the next four months. I had to go to an ear, nose, throat doctor here in town to figure out how to get my hearing back. My eardrum had been totally punctured. Praise God, I got my hearing back. But I remember from that lesson, when I see a red flag, I need to pay attention and I need to submit to authority. This is what Jude is saying here. He's saying, This is a warning. This is a warning. When you hear preachers, teachers, or even other believers saying, we can do what we want to do, there is no absolute truth. When you hear teachers saying, there is no hell, everybody's going to heaven, there is no consequences for our sins, he says, warning, red flag, red flag, red flag. They are denying the truth. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path that leads to life. Jesus said very few people will find it. There will be people who, he says, will get to heaven and say, we casted out demons in your name. We preached in your name. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Y'all, Christianity is real. This call to follow Jesus is real. I don't know about you, but this life on earth is short. This is a warm up. It's a dress rehearsal. Pretty soon we'll step into eternity and it is forever. And it is so important that we choose to live our lives in light of the truth of God's word to say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. God's not asking you to be perfect, but he is asking you to be surrendered. That when you miss it, you repent. When you miss it, you come back to Jesus. This message is just as much for me as it is for you, that we all need this. Jude says in verse 11, what sorrow awaits these people for they follow in the footsteps of Cain. Now, I want to just show you real quick. He gives us three Old Testament names here, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Let's talk about Cain. Cain was the brother of Abel, the son of Adam and Eve. He grew up with a mom and dad who committed the very first sin in the earth. Cain had a mom and dad who taught him the consequences of sin are real. Cain, your flesh is going to want to do things that is different than what God wants you to do. There's going to be this side of you that you're going to get angry at times, and you might want to just... Kill your brother, but don't do it because the consequences of murder are real, Cain. And, and, and listen, Cain was listening to his mom and she's like, there was this serpent who, who told me that God didn't know what he was talking about, 
who told me that God didn't have my best interest at heart, who told me that God's rules and laws were trying to hold me back from really experiencing intelligence and life. And I followed the serpent's deceiving words. And because of that, Cain, my son, your dad and I, we lost our opportunity to live in that garden. So Cain listens to his parents, but then he follows his flesh because he gets angry that God is blessing his brother Abel more than he's blessing him. And out of his anger and jealousy, we read in the book of Genesis chapter four that Cain killed his brother and the rest of his life lived from the consequences of that. Jude says, remember Cain. Then he says, remember Balaam. Who was Balaam? Balaam was a prophet in the Old Testament who actually had a position of authority by God to speak to the children of God, the Israelites. But he used his position for personal greed and gain. He was hired by a false prophet, Balak, to speak words that weren't from God, to say, I heard from God, when he absolutely did not hear from God. This is why we've got to be careful. If we believe everything, we'll fall for anything. But Balaam said things that weren't true. The Israelites listened. And because of that, Balaam got richer. But the people of Israel missed out on the plans and purpose of God. There was a portion of them that followed what he said. Jude says, remember, Balaam followed greed. Cain followed anger. Korah followed rebellion. Korah was a man who hated Moses being an authority. He rejected Moses as the leader. He said, who are you to lead us? You're a messed up man. Like, you've made mistakes. You have issues. By the way, everybody has issues. Anybody got issues in this room? We all got issues. But at the end of the day, God calls us to walk in humility, especially with those that are in authority. We're seeing a generation that does not want authority, right? I don't want people telling me what to do. I don't want the police telling me what to do. Defund the police. It's chaos when we reject authority. It's chaos. We need the police. We need the firemen. Shout out to all those who serve in the city. Policemen, firemen, everybody who helps protect our city. We need leaders. We need principals. We need superintendents. We need parents, right? We, like, we need to respect our parents. Now, this does not mean, this does not mean that there is zero corruption in leadership. We understand that there are corrupt leaders, but that doesn't mean we reject the idea of leadership. Korah rejected the whole idea. He's like, we don't need leaders. We're going to do what we want to do. He formed a rebellion. He took thousands of men with him, and they self-destroyed. It's a crazy story. You can read it in Numbers. But Jude says, when these people come into the church and they eat the Lord's Supper, next week we're going to have communion together. Next week is Palm Sunday. Don't miss it, y'all. It's the week before Easter. It's going to be a powerful service. We're going to pray for healing. We got miracle service on Wednesday night. Ty Barker's preaching this Wednesday night. It's going to be powerful. But, but, but next week, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. We're going to have communion in service, and we're going to pray. We're going to, we're going to thank God for what Jesus came to do. And, and why he gave his life on that cross. But Jude says, when people come and they take communion, and secretly they're deceiving you, wolves in sheep's clothing, he says, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you from your faith. They are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. God, deliver us from a self glorifying Christianity that is so anti-biblical. I pray, God, that we would put our faith only in Christ. I pray, God, that we would look to serve you and your kingdom and your will, God, and to serve others. Jude says, watch out, watch out. There's people who only care for themselves. They are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. They are trees in autumn that are doubly dead. Jesus said if he finds a tree that has no fruit in it, right, no fruit, he's looking for trees. He called the Pharisees this. He said, these are religious people who have no fruit. They're bearing no fruit. He says, they're pulled up by the roots. Jude gives us seven different descriptions of ungodly teachers and ungodly believers that have crept in the church. He says, number one, they reject God. They're ungodly. They don't want to have a God telling them what to do. Number two, they're dreamers. They're just creating ideas and theology from their dreams, not from the word of God. They've forsaken the word of God. Number three, they're like spots, blemishes. They just, they carry this this disdain towards anything supernatural. They're like clouds, number four, without water. This past week, we had a couple of days where it was really cloudy and it didn't rain. And this is what Jude says. He says, there's clouds that look like they're supposed to carry water and there's nothing in them. They're trees without fruit. They're waves that are raging, pulling you into the reefs. 
They're wandering stars. Beware. They're twisting grace. They're twisting the word of God. All right, let's keep going. Verse 14, he says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Now, hold on. Jude quotes from the Testament of Moses as well as from the book of Enoch. And if you ever look in your Bible and you're trying to find the book of Enoch, it's not there. And if you ever look for the book of Moses, it's not there. There's five books that Moses wrote, Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, what am I missing right there? Exodus, yeah. And, 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 and so there's not a book called Moses. But there was teachings and writings that Moses gave, and there was writings that Enoch made. There was a thing called canonization. It happened in 300 AD, 325 AD. There was a council, a group of scholars and people who studied the word of God. And they were looking across all these books that had been written by men and women during the time of Jesus and before Jesus. And they were putting together the Bible. And they asked themselves what should be in the Bible and what should be left out of the Bible that was written during this time. And there were a couple of books they left out, not because those books were 100% inaccurate, but there were parts of those books that were added by other people at different times that made them muddy and made them inconsistent with the rest of the scripture. But there was still percentages of those books that were written by men that are mentioned in the Bible, like Enoch. And Enoch warned before Noah, before his great-grandson Noah, when the flood would come, he warned that disaster was coming, destruction was coming. He prophesied, Jude quotes him, he says, he prophesied, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones. Can I tell you, Jesus is coming back again, church? And we better get ready, we better get ready, we better get ready. He says he's coming and there's gonna be a judgment and he will convict every person of the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against God. Jude says these people are grumblers and complainers. They find everything wrong with God. They're constantly critical and constantly living to satisfy their own desires. He says they brag loudly about themselves. They flatter other people to get something from them. They are not genuine. They are not real. Counterfeit Christianity. Last week, I held up a can of Dr. Pepper. Anybody like Dr. Pepper, Coke, Mountain Dew, Pop, all of it? Yeah. Okay, so on the back of these cans... You're like, is this a trick question? Am I gonna get in trouble for it? No, I like it too. But on the back of these cans, there's a term that says artificial flavors. Artificial, in other words, there's some fake things in here. And this is what Jude says, these people have crept in the church and they've created artificial Christianity. Two billion plus people claim to follow Christ. Two billion plus people call themselves Christians, but how many of them are interested in following Jesus? There's a term that we used in college called bandwagon fans. People who join the fan group of a team, it's March Madness, so basketball is huge right now, or during the Super Bowl, or when there's a big sporting event, people who jump on the bandwagon to be a fan just for a minute when that team is winning. It's easy to cheer for a team when the team is winning. But the real fans are the fans who've stuck by the team through the losses and through all the poor decisions that the team has made. And you say, I still believe in the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> this is our year, baby. This is our year. We say it every year. We say it, I know, I know it's not, all right? Some of y'all jumped on the Chiefs bandwagon fan this past year. Uh, but but here's, here's the point. Jesus is not interested in building a fan base. He's interested in inviting followers who will deny themselves, take up their cross and follow after him. Saying a prayer at the altar call is one thing, and it's beautiful to call in the name of Jesus, but that prayer should lead us into a transformed life. The longer I follow Jesus, the more I should change to become like Jesus. Now, I'm thankful that Jesus doesn't tell me, clean up, Paul David Darty, and then you can come follow me. No, no, he says, come follow me, and I'll clean you. Come as you are, but don't stay as you are. Like, come with all your dirty, sinful lifestyle, but don't stay in that for the rest of your Christian life. The longer you follow Jesus, the more a lot of that dirt and stuff that you carried when you first started begins to fall off. That's the power of sanctification. That's the power of Jesus changing us. And this is what Jude says in verse 17. He says, but you, somebody say us. us. He's now, he's now he's talking to the church. He says, but you, my dear friends, my church, those who call in the name of Jesus, he says, remember what the apostles 
spoke. Remember what Jesus said and remember what Paul the apostle said. Remember what Peter said and James said. Remember how they told you in the last days there will be people who deny the truth. There will be people whose purpose in life is to completely forsake the absolute truth of Jesus and pursue their own personal artificial Christianity. He says, it's coming. It's already here. I want the band to come out. And in verse 19, he says this. He says, these people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. Lord, purify us. Start in the church, God. I pray that we would repent, Lord. I repent for anything, God, that's, that's done it in the flesh. Lord, keep me in your Holy Spirit, God. I pray in Jesus' name that real fruits of the Holy Spirit would be evident in my life. God, that you would produce in me joy, peace, love, kindness, patience, gentleness, self-control, goodness, God. So Jude says, watch out. Let, let, let the church begin by personally repenting and getting things right and allowing the Holy Spirit to, to build you up. In verse 20, he says, but you, he's now talking to us. He says, you, dear friends, Victory Church, you must build each other up. This is why we gather. We sing the name of Jesus. And we're gonna sing it here in just a minute. I wanna go back into that. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. There's power when we worship but we can't forsake the teaching of the word. We can't forsake doctrine. We can't forsake understanding why we believe what we believe and how do we live it out. How do we separate artificial Christianity and real Christianity? Here's the separation. There are people who say, I believe in Jesus, but their life reflects no desire to actually follow his teachings. My mom, I remember I was in Mexico, 1992. Our family went to Mexico, I was a kid, and me and my brother were chasing crabs on the beach, and it was a red flag day. My mom got into the ocean. We were on the uh, Acapulco, we were in uh, Oaxaca, uh, Puerto Escondido, and we're right there on the beach, Pacific Ocean, Mexico, doing ministry. We had a free day, free afternoon before the crusade that night. She gets in the water, starts swimming, and there was a riptide. What she couldn't see that was beneath the water. Sometimes we can't see the things that are beneath the surface. And that riptide began to pull her away. And she was shouting for help, but we couldn't hear her because the waves were too loud. And we were distracted by the crabs and the lizards. Talk about a picture of the church at times. While someone is being drifted and pulled away, we're distracted by menial things. And she was getting pulled further and further out into the Pacific Ocean. My dad wasn't there that day. He wasn't on the beach. He was preparing in the hotel room, in the missions base room. It was just me and John out there. My mom's getting pulled further and further. We don't even see her because we're distracted by the lizards and the crabs on the beach. And a missionary comes down who speaks both English and Spanish. And he says, where's your mom? Where's your mom? I said, I don't know. And he looks and she's almost a mile away from shore. And he, he sees her and she's, I mean, her eyes are extremely terrified. She's She's about to lose her life in this riptide. Mom of four kids, co-pastor of victory, and she's been pulled out into sea. I think we need to be aware that deception comes for any of us. And so we've got to watch out for each other. In love, watch out for each other. Build each other up. And that missionary jumped into the water and swam all the way out there. He was strong, but he knew this riptide was so strong that they weren't gonna be able to swim straight back. They were gonna have to swim at a sideways angle to get back to shore. And he was able to save and rescue my mom and get her back to the beach and come back towards us. And I remember her telling us the story. And me and John, we, were, we, were so, we felt bad. We were like, oh, our bad. We, we should have been looking. But I think about how, as the church, Jude is telling all of us, he's saying, dear friends, look out for each other. Build each other up in your most holy faith. Care for each other. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want the band to come out. He says, Jesus is coming back. He will bring you eternal life in this way. This is important right here. If you're taking notes, just underline the scripture. You will keep yourselves safe in God's love. Okay? So now I say, I believe in Jesus. And I'm a work in progress. I'm so glad when Jesus invited Peter, James, and Thomas he didn't say, I'm going to card you at the door. And if you send this week, you're not allowed in the room. No, Jesus said, come in. Peter, come in. I know you cussed this week. I know you had a bad thought. I know you got angry. I know you betrayed me and the rooster crowed three times. But Peter, I'm praying for you. 
Keep coming to church. And the more you come, let me clean you. Let me change you. Let me renew you. Let me transform you. Let me make you more like Jesus. He says, Thomas, I know you have doubts. I know you struggle sometimes to live with faith, but I'm not going to reject you. I'm not going to tell you to stop coming to church. I want you to keep coming with all your doubts. I want you to come with all those feelings of fear because the church is the perfect place to bring all of our problems and questions and struggles and every, like, where else are we going to go? He's the, he's the one that has eternal life. Where else do I go with all of my problems? I go to Jesus. And this is a perfect church for imperfect people, but church, that is not permission for us to stay the way we are the rest of our lives. Let us keep becoming more like Jesus. Jude says, build each other up in your most holy faith. Build each other up. He says in that same verse, verse 20, he says, pray, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. We have power in the Holy Spirit. We have power in the Holy Spirit. When we pray, when we worship, when we study the Word of God, when we pray over our children during worship, I just was putting my hands on my sons, on, on their heads, and I was just praying, Lord, I thank you've not given them the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. We gotta pray for the next generation because there are people who have crept into the schools of America to twist the children of the 21st century to not know what gender they are, what sexual preference they want, who they're gonna be, and they're trying to twist kids to think that they are the final authority. I'm sorry, but humans, we are not the final authority over our body. God is the final authority. He is the, he is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. And we gotta come in and we gotta teach the truth and we gotta pray in the spirit. When we don't know what to say, we don't know what to pray, we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jude says in verse 21, we gotta wait for the mercy of God. We gotta pray and we gotta prepare. Jesus said that, that, that we should be waiting like those virgins that he talked about in Matthew 25, who had their, their lamps ready with oil, that the fire was burning, that we should be waiting with an anticipation. Maranatha, Maranatha, my friends, Jesus is coming back again soon. And we should wait with the sense of, if I sinned this week, I should be down at the altar. I should be asking God to renew my mind. I should be asking God to renew my heart. I should be asking God to change me. I should not be living with this feeling of anything goes and he's never coming back. So I might as well do what I want to do. No, I should be living as if he might come back tonight and I got to get right and I got to repent and I got to come down to the altar. I got to talk to God and I got to open up my heart. He says, wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. He will bring it to us. He's gonna bring us into eternal life. He says in this way, this is so important, underline this, if you're taking notes, just underline the scripture in your Bible. He says in this way, you will keep yourselves in God's love. Keep yourself safe. How do I keep myself safe in God's love? I avoid the danger of deception. I reject everything that the enemy is trying to pull, all the lies of the enemy. The lies of the enemy. The, the enemy will try to keep us in lies. So I wanna just end with a few thoughts here. How do we stay? safe in God's love. We've got to stay in the word. Everybody say, stay in the word. Stay in the word. Stay in the word. Stay, in the word. stay, stay reading the Bible. When someone introduces a new idea to you, a new theology to you, just go, you know, I'm going to go to the word of God and see what God's word has to say about this. What is the grace of God for? The grace of God is the free gift of his mercy, of his forgiveness, but it is also the empowerment to walk in victory over our fleshly cravings and desires. So the word of God, it's a compass, it teaches me, it divides. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Step by step you lead me and I will follow you all of my days. How can a young man keep his way pure? Keeping his mind steadfast on the word of God. Lord, I pray that your word would be written on my heart. Lord, write your word in my heart. God, renew us, wash us in your word today. For any person that just feels overwhelmed by sin or fear or shame or anything that's not of you, I pray that today your word washes us, that it points us back to the right path, to true north. Number two, stay humble, stay humble. Lucifer was the first one to lose his place with God before Adam and Eve. Lucifer had a place of authority. He was a worship leader. But when he began to exalt himself as if he knows better than God, that prideful, when your head gets big, your brain gets small. And when you got a big head, you start making yourself feel like you are all that in a bag of chips. 
You are all, like, you are amazing. You're the man and nobody can tell you what to do. And you become entitled and you start doing whatever you want because your head's so big. Humility keeps us in a place of brokenness. God will not reject a broken and a contrite spirit. Why did David get written down as a man after God's own heart even after he sinned big time? Because he stayed broken to God. Saul never really repented for what he did. He just kept on doing what he wanted to do. Kept on living to please himself and to impress people. This is why it's so important for us to stay humble. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Stay in the word, stay humble. Number three, someone told me when I stepped in as pastor, they said, Paul, stay small, stay small. Don't ever think you're above another person. You are here to serve, serve God, serve others. Jesus took a towel and he took a, a water basin and just washed people's feet. Part of me just wants to wash your feet every Sunday. Al and Pat, I just wanna wash your feet. But this is, this is what Jesus called us to do, to serve one another, that none of us are above another person. Number three, stay in Christ, stay in Christ. Paul said, in Christ, we are righteous. In Christ, we are adopted in the family of God. In Christ, we have the master key, Christ in me, the hope of glory. In Christ, we have the riches of God in Christ Jesus. We have joy, we have peace. In Christ, we have forgiveness of sins. When I'm in Christ and I'm not in the world and I'm not in what other people say about me, I'm not in what I say about myself, but I'm in what Christ says about me, I'm a lot safer when I'm in Christ than when I'm in Paul or in, in somebody else's opinion about me. Number four, stay surrendered. Stay surrendered. What does this mean? This just means that when you, when you miss it, don't, 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 don't think to yourself, I don't need to go down to the altar. I don't need to repent. I don't need to get right with God. Intimacy requires surrender. Intimacy requires me being real with God. It requires me saying, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. I, I need your grace today. God, I need your strength. I got impatient. I got upset. God's not asking for perfect people. He's asking for surrendered people. This is why those disciples, even though they missed it, they just kept following him. People said, when are you going to leave this Savior? Peter said, where else would we go? He has the words of eternal life. What else am I gonna do? This is, where I, this is what I gotta do. Paul said in Galatians 5, don't walk by the flesh, but walk by the Spirit. If you live by the Spirit, if you surrender to the Holy Spirit, you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. I remember talking to this guy in college, and I'll close with this story. He had settled into this addiction. And when I say addiction, I mean it was from the morning till the evening, he was consumed by this addiction. And it was not a healthy addiction. I won't say what it was, but it was a very unhealthy thing. And it was against God's will. But he was a Christian. He went to ORU, and we were there at the same time. This was several years ago. And I said, bro, why do you defend this? He said, well, the grace of God covers it. Blood of Jesus. I'm saved. I'm not saved by my works. I'm saved by the grace of God. I said, yeah, but I don't think the grace of God means you could do whatever you want to do. And I remember we got into this big debate and it turned into a fight. And I was not very kind or loving with my words. And I won the debate, but I lost the friendship. And he basically just said, I'm done with you, Paul. You're so judgmental. And I felt so bad because I was like, man, I, I was trying to save my brother. I was trying to like help him, but I didn't do it the right way. Next week, we're gonna talk about how do we reach people the right way? How do we love people with the truth? And how do we not just lose friendships and win debates? But I remember, I remember just feeling really bad and I tried to apologize and he left and I didn't see him for years. More than 10 years went by, I didn't see him. Just a couple of years ago, I ran into him. We were out of state. I was at a conference and I was walking down the hallway. Thousands of people are there. It's this missions conference. And he goes, Doherty! And I was like, oh my goodness. It's the guy I got into a fight about over this addiction. And I thought he was gonna run and punch me like, you judgmental man. You know, I was like, ah came and gave me the biggest hug and I start tearing up and I said, bro, I haven't seen you in like 12, 15 years. He's like, I know, man. He's like, I really went off the deep end. I, did, I left ORU, didn't graduate, really went deep into that addiction that I talked to you about. He said, and then one night I was at a connect group and people started praying for me. And he said, I remembered what you said to me. And even though you didn't say it the right way, I needed to hear it. He said, I surrendered and I've been sober ever since. He said, I'm a sober man. I've been free from that addiction. He said, I'm better, man.
My heart is more pure. My life feels more on track. I got my brain back. I got my mind back. And he said, I totally, I haven't gone back to that. And I'm just sitting there. I was like, oh my goodness, I can feel the presence of this guy was so much more lighter because he had gotten free. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. This is why Jude is telling us, he's saying, church, you are so much more powerful when you are free from being contained by the desires of the flesh, being addicted and, and held down by, I just wanna pray. I want us to stand to our feet all over this room. I wanna pray for anyone here today that just says, I wanna walk in the freedom of Jesus Christ. I wanna walk in that honor of following Jesus, not living for my flesh, but following after Jesus, fighting against the deceiving lies of the, of the enemy. I think the devil has tried to deceive so many people with lies that keep us, keep us in bondage, keep us bound by shame and fear and go, I've already messed up, might as well just keep doing what I wanna do. And today is a great day for freedom, Freedom Sunday. Today's a great day to just break the chains, to let the Holy Spirit renew you and wash you. If you're here today and you just say, man, I just wanna be washed and renewed and I wanna follow Jesus and I want the chains of sin, the chains of deception to be broken off of my mind, my heart, my body, my life, my family, the curses of the enemy, the generational curses, whatever those lies are, I want you to just raise your hand up today. You're saying, that's me today, from the front to the back. If you raised your hand or you just need to get down to the altar to surrender, I want you to leave your seat. Come and meet me at the altar. And as you come down to this altar, we're just gonna worship for the next few minutes. If you're here today and you say, I need prayer, I need a breakthrough in my life, I need Jesus to do something new and fresh, I need the renewal renewing of the mind. I need God to change me. I need him to break some chains off me. I need him to break free some addictions off my life. I'm ready to get real with God. I want the Holy Spirit to wash me, to renew me. I want to live with that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control all over this room. Maybe you're here today and you say, Paul, I'm not right with God. I don't know if I've ever surrendered to Jesus. Today is a great day to get saved. Today is a great day to get healed. Today's a great day to get forgiven. Today's a great day to put your faith in Jesus Christ and truly surrender. Let's just worship. Let's sing this song. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, thank you, Jesus.
silence fear you silence fear you silence fear just sing out the name of Jesus 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 we say Jesus Jesus As I was praying, I just felt like God showed me a picture of a basketball goal. And my kids, they love it when we lower the goal because they can make shots easier. When we get it really low, when it's six feet high, you know, they don't want it at 10 feet high, the standard. They want it lower because they can almost touch the rim. One of them can, he can hang on the rim. They give each other high fives, like, yeah, we made our shots. But we're making shots on a lower standard. And there, there, is, there is this tendency to go, maybe I should just lower the goal and then I'll feel better about my life. But God says, raise the standard, raise the goal up, raise the goal up. Because listen, it may not feel good at first, but I'm telling you, if you will aim your life, if we will aim our lives as the church towards the standard of God, not the standard of American cultural values, what they deem is okay, but what is God saying? And I know it's not easy. I know it's, it's a call for me, for all of us to say, Lord, I want to pursue, I want to pursue the right standard. God, I want to pursue to live a life that is pleasing to you. Lord, I want to pursue your call. I want to pursue your plans, your purpose. God, I want your Holy Spirit to wash me, renew me, guide me. And here's the good thing. God is not condemning us today. This healthy conviction, this is the kindness of God. He's leading us towards repentance. He's saying, yes, this is good. Even if you got to do this every single day for the rest of your life, he says, every day, just get your heart before the Lord. Get your heart ready before the Lord. Just say, Lord, I need you today. God, I ask for your mercy today. Lord, I ask you to help me be aware today of your Holy Spirit while I'm at work, while I'm with friends, while I'm doing this hobby. God, I pray, Lord, that you would guard my mind, my mouth, my heart, Lord. Deliver me, God, from, from lies of the devil that would keep me bound by any spirit that's deceiving, any spirit that's not you, God, get me, get me in your plan, your purpose, your word. Like St. Patrick prayed, Christ be with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ beside me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in the mouth of every man who speaks of me, Christ in the mind of every man who thinks of me, Christ, Lord, I pray that you would rule and reign in my life, Lord. I wanna be in you, I wanna know you, God, I wanna know your love. Cause you have no rifle, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the, glory. Yours is the name. Yours is above the every. name above all names. You have no rifle. You no idols, you have no, no equal. God, I surrender. Lord, I want you to rule and reign in my life. Your name, God, is higher than any other name. Your way. Lord, I want to know you. I want to live for you, God. I want to surrender to you. Lord, I want to, I want to follow after you.
What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Lord, I just thank you right now for your presence, God. Lord, I thank you for your love, your mercy, God. I repent where I've missed it. I ask you, Lord Jesus, just to renew me, God. Revive me, Lord. I pray, God, that you would work in us and through us, God. Help us, Lord, to live a life worthy of the calling we've received, God. Lord, help us to yield to your Holy Spirit. God, help us, Lord, to walk in gentleness with each other, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, God patience with each other, just forbearing each other. I pray, God, that we would be quick to forgive, slow to speak, slow to get angry, God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would walk in um, just generosity, God, that we would not be greedy for selfish gain, but God, we would, Lord, trust you in our finances, trust you, God, in the needs and, and, and even the wants, God, that we would surrender. Your kingdom come, your will be done. God, I pray, Lord, that you just keep us in line with your word, God. Keep us on that narrow path following after you, Lord. Help us to walk in self-control. Help us to walk in goodness and faithfulness, Lord, to your, to your spirit, to your word. Just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I surrender. I repent of my sins. I receive your forgiveness. I believe in you, Jesus. You died on the cross. You rose from the grave. You are my Lord, my Savior, and I want to live my life for your glory. I'm all yours. In Jesus' name, amen.